All right, so it looks like we are recording. Good morning, welcome. Um, we usually like to start off our private pilot ground school with any, you know, opening remarks from anybody. You know, if you have been studying, doing your homework assignments, um, thinking about private pilot ground school or life in general, if there's any opening remarks that, you know, we'd like to open up the class with discussion wise, you know, it's a free table. Um, they sent an email out saying something about summer classes. I think it was something about them being online, I believe. I didn't read the email all the way through, but I saw it online, so I was just kind of curious. Yeah, great question. You know, administrative things. We are part of this university, um, and I got an email as well. My understanding of the email was that uh, there's different types of summer school. So you could have like a summer one semester, which is different than a summer two semester. So, uh, you know, everybody's worried about the virus and the germs. So the idea is that summer one, they're making the decision, the university is making the decision. I'm not sure if it's a whole university wide or if it's just a aviation technology center, but there was a decision about summer one. So if you're a summer one semester, you're a student that's trying to sign up for classes for summer one, then you can already hedge your bets. I think it's already, you know, set in stone that that would be an online distance education format. Uh, they still have a question mark surrounding summer two. So uh, it really applies a lot to the mechanics. So uh, the mechanics students um, and they're, pushing back the semesters for their trainings. Um, and I think that semester two, summer two is currently what they're shooting for to try to get in class, in person, face-to-face -face classes. That's currently the what my understood, my understanding of the email was. So, you know, Nick brought it up, you know, great question. We got an email um, and I believe that the idea is summer two is what they're currently shooting for, for in-face class-to-class contact again. And, you know, there's a question mark surrounding that, and it says they'll keep us updated as any new information arises. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question or not, or if you're thinking the same thing. Yeah, it answers my question. I was just kind of curious and trying to bring it up for everyone else. Yeah, I mean, I kind of I miss flying with my students, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm a lucky person that, you know, still has access to airplanes. Uh, the flight department has a policy going on now where they want every, you know, airplane to run for at least one hour every two weeks just to keep them up. So, you know, I've been going out to the airport, you know, not so often to exercise the airplanes. You know, I, I personally have a friend that owns an airplane in, in Greenwood Airport, and I go down there and, and exercise that airplane too. But you know, it's, it's quite a shift for us, you know, when we're used to, you know, flying so much. Um, and now here we are just sitting on the ground talking about flying a lot more. But uh, I think it's supposed to be all in the interest of safety. And uh, we hope to get back to flying airplanes soon, which kind of transitions into this announcement that uh, the director of aviation, uh, so Mike Garrick, uh, our director of aviation, uh, sent an email out, sent an announcement, I posted it on the blackboard. Um, they're saying the date of May 27th. So that is the current date that our director of aviation is telling us, the flight department, when we anticipate that we would get back to flight training in the aircraft. So, you know, um, it says flight training in aircraft has been suspended tentatively till May 27th. We'll be monitoring this ever changing situation. We'll inform students when we resume flight training. So I marked it in my calendar, May 27th, and that's kind of the light at the end of my tunnel that I'm hoping for. Um, in the meanwhile, I'm happy to at least talk about flying with y'all and help us get some good, good knowledge about private pilot ground school material. So we appreciate the interaction from Nick, bringing up some of the thoughts that he's been having with the emails. You know, we like to begin our class by letting everybody have a voice. If there's any um, questions or comments or thoughts going around the room, you know, now would be a great time while we have an open floor before we dive in.
All right. Well, I'm not really hearing a lot of feedback and I'm, I'm not seeing Isaac. Just one more time. I'm not seeing Isaac Nesbitt and I'm not seeing Jacob Helton. So, um, oh, well, we'll uh, hopefully they come in soon. So basically where we're at, uh, we are chapter six people. Uh, we're about to hit the halfway point of chapter six. Um, this chapter that we're on is weather. Huge topic. People study their whole life on weather, get you know all sorts of degrees, and they still can't predict it um, accurately. So it's a huge topic. Uh, we're not going to be able to cover everything you know I've ever learned about weather you know in just you know a few meetings. Uh, however, I'm going to do my best job I can to try to hit the high points. Um, you know, you got to do the best job you can. Make sure to read your book. Make sure to work on your homework assignments. There are questions at the end of each chapter. Um, I've been I've been working on grades. I've been working on grades, and what I've noticed is that I really haven't been gathering any quiz grades. Um, so I don't know. I don't want to do you a disservice. I feel like by me, the instructor, offering quizzes and asking for quizzes during our class time. It helps because then the students have motivation to try to, you know, read ahead and try to work and understand it, you know, instead of just cramming right before the test. So I really like the idea of trying to, you know, get a quiz grade in for chapter six, but I'm really kind of trying to think what the best strategy would be. Um, just, you know, is there, there's probably some people on laptops, there's probably some people on smartphones, uh, some of y'all might be on an iPad or a, or a tablet. So I, I was thinking about maybe trying to possibly offer a quiz and then you could email the response, but I realized that may not be ideal if you're on a phone or a tablet because for you to have to switch apps might cause, you know, a crash or an issue there. Um, I think that we could chat back and forth through the Zoom app, but I don't know if you're able to chat to one on one person like you could send me the answers or if it's going to send it out in a way that everybody sees it. I think there's two ways you can do it, but it could kind of be confusing and then a few people accidentally send it um, in the group chat instead of privately. I don't know. So Nick is the one interacting with me. Nicholas, I just sent you a, a message. I said the word test and uh, it seems like you see it or maybe you don't see it. Yeah, I see it. All right. So, um, Let's try to think about that for our next meeting. So in our next meeting, uh, which is going to be Monday, kind of anticipate that I'm going to try to give you guys a quiz over chapter six. So next Monday, anticipate that we'll have a quiz over chapter six, and you'll have to be logged in, um, and you'll try to message me through the Zoom account. If it doesn't work, then I'll just, you know, give you points for trying. But uh, it'd be nice to, to try to, you know, continue collecting quiz grades and give you more motivation to, you know, uh, keep reading the chapter and studying up. So at this point, we've talked a lot about of our administrative um, thoughts, and I don't hear a lot of other issues. Was there any good weather jokes? You know, we're in, we're in weather and nobody's been giving us any good weather jokes yet. That's because they're not in season yet. I love it. I love it. Cool. And with that, I guess we'll, uh, we'll, we'll transition over. So uh, I'll go ahead and hit my, my screen share button. So at this point, uh, I believe you guys are seeing my, my blackboard. Um, what you'll notice is that uh, as we go through chapter six, some of the presentations have changed format. Uh, we had Prezi, P-R-E-Z-I, some Prezi presentations, which are different than PowerPoint presentations. In theory, a Prezi presentation is actually supposed to be uh, more universal. Anybody can log in and see a Prezi presentation. You don't necessarily have to have the, the PowerPoint software. So I'll just show you, when you go to content and you check out chapter six, uh, we're going to have options on some of the sections. There will be options for you to, to, to view the presentation as either PowerPoint or Prezi. So if you're a person that likes an interactive, um, you can move it around more, uh, then you can click through the Prezi links if you want to follow along 
on your own device. But what I have found is that the Prezi presentations are more uh, Flash based. Um, so the software for Flash, I guess, is more difficult on the computer. So when we're trying to do video streaming, I think that the uh, the Prezi presentations cause issues. So like towards the end of class, I'll start to you know get some freezing issues on my end. So um, I've been trying to make it better for everybody, and uh, I've been spending time converting a lot of those Prezi's into PowerPoints, uh, which seems to work a lot better for us for our streaming. So uh, this is where I will be today. I'll be on the Chapter 6B Weather Patterns Presentation PowerPoint. And uh, you can follow along that way. Or if you like to check out Prezi sometime on your own, on your own end, you can click through the, the Prezi link, but I'll, I'll avoid that with our video stream today. So this is about where we left off. Here is a PowerPoint presentation, and we've been talking about the states of matter. States of matter changing. Um, a quick review, uh, we had um, ice, water, and water vapor. Uh, one of the questions, one of the questions would be uh, what two processes, what two processes could add moisture, um, let's say the word water vapor, what two processes could add water vapor into the atmosphere? Any, any, any ideas? Who wants to step up? Two processes that can add water vapor to the atmosphere. It's sublimation and evaporation. 100% correct answer. Sublimation and evaporation. So you might want to put that one in the back of your brain. It's one of the questions in the, in the back of the, the chapters. Um, we're thinking about having a quiz soon, so some things to think about. Um, so in the process of sublimation, in the process of evaporation, the actual water molecule itself is going to absorb heat energy. It's going to absorb heat energy, which would leave the ambient outside environment slightly cooler. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Big conversation, latent heat energy, and uh, this little review, we covered that pretty thoroughly last time. Okay, so we're going to keep moving forward. Uh, our next slide, new slide. Hooray for new slides. We have a new slide talking about humidity. Humidity is the amount of moisture in the air. Um, some really basic facts here. Warmer air can hold more water vapor. Very, very simple. Very basic understanding. Uh, you need to commit that to memory so you can understand and comprehend a lot of the other phenomenon that are going to happen with weather. So colder air cannot hold as much moisture. Warm air can hold much more moisture. Okay. Uh, I normally think about it as um, warmer air, all the molecules are going to expand and it'll leave more space for moisture molecules. Colder air is going to shrink and there's less space for, for moisture molecules. Okay, we got a vocabulary word, relative humidity. Relative humidity is a ratio of the amount of water vapor present compared to the total amount of water vapor that the parcel of air could hold. So when we study air, we typically use the word parcel of air. Um, it's an undefined volume of air. In my mind, I like to think about it as a pillowcase, like a pillowcase worth of air, but it could be a larger or smaller vessel, whatever amount of air you want to analyze. But when you analyze a parcel of air, then you can imagine that that parcel of air would have different temperature, pressure, and moisture. And for that one parcel of air, relative humidity is a ratio where the amount of water vapor present compared to the total amount of water vapor that parcel can hold. So if you reach 100% humidity, then, the watt, then the, that parcel of air cannot hold any more moisture. And any more moisture that gets added is going to condensate out and become visible moisture. That process was called condensation. OK, we're on to the, another vocabulary word, dew point. Very important vocabulary word, dew point. Um, you could call it saturation point. It's a, it's along the exact same idea that we talked about. The temperature at which the air reaches a state where it can hold no more water. It can occur by either lowering the temperature or increasing the moisture content. Uh, some people could argue that it could also occur by lowering the pressure, but I, I, I'm a fan of these two basic 
these two basic uh, strategies instead. Uh, my old boss would always, would always quiz the students and he'd say, oh, what are the two ways that you can create a cloud? Well, you either cool the air, the parcel of air down to the dew point. And once it's cooled to the dew point, it cannot hold any more moisture. So then that moisture gets condensated out in the form of a cloud. So you either cool the air to the dew point or you add moisture. By adding moisture to the air parcel, uh, that is going to raise the dew point. By adding moisture to an air parcel, that will raise the dew point. So uh, let's kind of talk about temperature and dew point real quick. Um, you know, uh, what's today's temperature? I got a fancy app here on my phone. It's called Aero Weather, one of a really, really nice apps. And uh, Aero Weather tells us that today um, we are looking at five degrees Celsius at Eagle Creek Airport. If you don't have this app, it's really great. Um, uh, you can't really see my phone, but it's called Aero Weather. It's in our syllabus, one of the, the apps that you can download and stay on top of weather information. Now that we're in the weather chapter, it's super good for you to download Aero Weather app, and then you can have access to all this information um, from the weather stations. So at the Eagle Creek Airport right now, we're seeing a temperature of five. We're seeing a dew point of negative seven. So the temperature right now at Eagle Creek is five degrees Celsius. The dew point is negative seven. So what they often talk about is the dew point spread. The dew point spread. So our spread today is 12 degrees. So the dew point is lower than the temperature. That is normal. In fact, it's kind of impossible to have a dew point that is warmer than the temperature. So if you're still trying to figure it out and you're still trying to wrap your brain around this concept, it's impossible to have a dew point that is warmer than the current temperature. So that we have a dew point and temperature spread. The dew point is gonna be colder than the temperature. So whatever the temperature is, that's the temperature of the air mass, the parcel of air. And as you cool the temperature, as it gets colder, we get closer to the dew point. Cold air cannot hold as much moisture as warm air. Once we hit the dew point, we are now 100% saturated and air is going, um, the air is no longer gonna remain suspended, those, those water vapor molecules. And so then they will condensate into cloud. If the temperature and dew point are equal, if the temperature and dew point are equal, that is fog, F-O-G, fog. So if the temperature and dew point are perfectly equal, we are looking at fog because the water vapor can no longer remain suspended as invisible water vapor. It has to condensate out. And if it condensates out at the surface, we're dealing with fog. So uh, we're getting y'all warmed up on temperature and dew point and temperature dew point spread. What does all this mean to you as a pilot? Um, they call it like a rule of thumb, like you got <clears throat> five fingers on your hand. And uh, every once in a while, I'm just going to double check my Zoom app to make sure that one of our other students isn't trying to get in. Uh, think about how you have five fingers on your hand. So if you have five fingers on your hand, then what you would find is that when you get within five, uh, that is when you uh, would have the possibility of seeing fog or low clouds. So if the temperature and dew point spread is within five degrees, then that means you are more at risk, it is more likely that you could develop low clouds, fog. This temperature dew point conversation is uh, going to be one of the questions um, for, the, for the test, the FAA written test. And the idea is that because you know the standards, you know the standards, say air uh, cools two degrees Celsius for every thousand feet that you climb, you could predict what altitude clouds might form at. Interesting. So we said today's temperature is five degrees Celsius. Today's dew point is negative seven. That is a, um, what is that? Seven plus, gosh, I'm off. Five plus seven. That is a 12 degree spread. 
we have a 12 degree spread. Temperature cools two degrees Celsius for every thousand feet. 12 degrees sp spread divided by two, I'm at six. So I could predict that if clouds were gonna form outside, they might form somewhere around 6,000 feet of altitude. And then the tricky part becomes AGL or MSL. So that would be 6,000 AGL because that temperature of seven, that dew point of negative seven is taken from a surface observation station at Eagle Creek Airport. On the day of the written exam, the FAA will ask you a few questions like that, um, but they will throw another loop in there and they will use Fahrenheit. So if you're doing Fahrenheit math for clouds and dew points and temperatures, uh, it's 4.4 degrees Fahrenheit for every thousand feet that we climb. So this has been me uh, covering dew point and uh, we can keep moving. Maybe, hitting the button. There it goes, dew and frost. So that's gonna occur when water condenses or deposits out of the air. It's exactly what we're talking about. Uh, frost re represents a significant hazard if not removed. So we have this invisible water vapor that exists in the air and it can become visible moisture. It can become visible moisture when uh, it becomes a liquid instead of a gas. When the water molecule converts from being a gas to a liquid, that is when we could see cloud. A cloud is visible moisture. That's when we could see dew. Dew is visible moisture. And if the temperature is right, we could see frost. That'll be one of the questions on your written exam. Uh, it'll talk about what conditions must be present to uh, experience frost. What conditions must be present to experience frost? Um, and the answer would be that the collecting surface is at or below freezing and that the uh, temperature is cooled to the dew point. So I'm getting a pop-up on my Zoom map and it looks like Christian got kicked out and he can't get back in. Oh no. Well, um, and thank you, Isaac, uh, for helping me out with these private messages. It seems like that might work out for us next, for, uh, next meeting. Let's see. So Christian got kicked out and he can't get back in. Bummer, Christian. Well, what do we do? Um, I got the link on Blackboard. Uh, he's got the access to the link in Slack. So whenever he clicks the button to try to get back in, I will let him into the room. So I'll just try to keep my eye on our Zoom app. But uh, I don't see him trying to get back in right now, so there's not a lot I can do for him. But gosh, Christian, we hope to find you soon. Okay, uh, well, let's grab another slide and then we'll check our waiting room to see if he's uh, trying to get back in yet. All right, so that's dew and frost. Uh, those are both types of visible moisture. They happen because the air mass cannot hold any more water vapor in, in a gaseous form. So the air mass gets cooled to the dew point. If the dew point's below freezing, it would create frost. That would be, um, what do we call that? Deposition, sublimation? So if it, uh, we would call that deposition. So frost is really a product of deposition, whereas dew would be a product of condensation. So dew and frost. Frost a, uh, presents a significant hazard if not removed. It affects the shape of your, of your airfoil. So your, uh, your wing, your uh, elevator, your horizontal stabilizer, whatever the airfoil is, uh, you don't want frost on it. It really affects your ability to fly. All right. Well, we're not seeing him get back in, so we'll just keep pushing. All right, so we're moving into clouds. Uh, it's a little bit of a transition. We're still talking about this magical molecule called water and clouds. Um, it looks like we have a big 
big slide that says clouds. Um, it's composed of many small droplets of water or even possibly ice crystals. Water vapor condenses onto tiny particles in the air called condensation nuclei. Um, clouds will usually form as soon as the air becomes saturated. Clouds are a weather signpost. Clouds are a weather signpost. All right, Christian's trying to get back in. I hit the admit button. Looks like that should help him out. We're happy to have Christian back with us. We're talking about clouds. And uh, we said clouds are kind of a weather signpost. So you can try to anticipate what that air might be like by looking at the clouds. If you have clouds that have a certain shape, you might make certain predictions about what that air mass is. Is the air mass stable? Is the air mass unstable? Is this air mass turbulent? Is this air smooth? You can predict by looking at the clouds. Uh, clouds are grouped by families. Um, described by appearance. So clouds are grouped as families described by appearance. Um, you can also say uh, altitude. Jake Kelton has entered the waiting room. All right, so it looks like Jake's trying to get in today. We're happy to have you, Jake. Make a note in the grade book here. Jake Kelton made it. So just Thanks a lot, right. sorry. Hey, we're happy to have you. Cool. So we're talking about clouds. Clouds are Clouds are cool, you know, remember all this, when you when you lay back and you try to figure out what shape it is and you try to figure out animals. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, big, big topics, condensation nuclei. We've talked about that multiple times now. It's dirt, dust, debris, pollution, anything for the water molecule to attach to that's suspended in the air. There's actually more condensation nuclei around a city than there is a country farmland. So you're actually more likely to see uh, fog and smog in industrial areas where there's more pollution. All right, well, let's click the button, see what happens next. Fog, F-O-G. So there are multiple types of fog. Um, you will have to know the different types of fog to get through the test. So uh, the FAA written exam has a lot of fog questions. So what is a fog? It's a cloud at the surface. All right. Um, the first type of fog we're gonna try to discuss is radiation fog. It says radiation fog. It says the surface cooling also cools the adjacent air to its dew point. So what we're really talking about with radiation fog, we are not talking about solar radiation. Remember we said that there were two types of radiation. We said there's short wave energy that comes from the sun and there's a long wave radiation that, that the earth uh, releases heat. So short wave energy from the sun, solar radiation penetrates clouds, heats up planet earth. <clears throat> Later on, the Earth starts to release that energy that had been absorbed. The Earth, the surface of the Earth is releasing the heat energy that it once absorbed. But now that the Earth is releasing radiation, it is called long wave radiation. It is not short wave, it's long wave. That long wave radiation is not nearly as powerful as the solar radiation. This is what they call the greenhouse effect. So the idea is now that this long wave terrestrial radiation, as it rises um, up from planet Earth, as the Earth gives, out, gives off its heat, releases the heat that it had been absorbing all day long, it actually leaves the air mass cooler. The air mass near the surface is actually cooler after the Earth gives up its heat. So that cooler air mass near the surface now is extra cold, reaches the dew point, and we have fog. Radiation fog. So one of the test questions about radiation fog, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll present it to the class right now. Maybe somebody wants to participate. Are we more likely to see radiation fog occur on a cloudy or a clear morning? Clear. 100% correct answer. Explain it to us. Why? We want to know.
Maybe the answer is I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, <laughs> but I appreciate the participation. Thank you. Um, so a cloud acts like a blanket. So if we have a cloud layer, like a stratus cloud layer, we have, you know, a, a sky that is full of clouds. Um, that terrestrial radiation, those long wave heat energies that are coming off the surface of the earth, the cloud can act like a blanket because the long wave terrestrial radiation cannot penetrate clouds. So uh, when you're studying the weather and you think it's going to be a clear night or a cloudy night, that will actually affect the temperatures in the early morning hours. Well, will affect the temp temperatures all night. If you have a clear night, it'll be extra cold. If you have a cloudy night, it will be slightly warmer. Why? Because those clouds act like a blanket and they trap the terrestrial radiation coming off of Mother Earth. So you'll have a question about radiation fog on the written exam, probably on our test as well, and radiation fog is more likely on a clear, calm night. Clear, calm night. That's when you're going to see the radiation fog. Why was it clear? Because if there was clouds, that would trap the heat. And if we want to create a cloud, if we want to create fog, we have to cool the air mass down to the dew point. If we're trapping heat, we're not going to see as dramatic of cooling. Uh, we said the word little wind. So with fog, it is very unlikely to see fog if it's super windy. So like if you're taking notes and you're still trying to figure it out, the stronger the wind, we're talking about surface winds. The stronger the surface winds, the less likelihood of seeing fog. Now, you could have, you can make the argument. You could argue that we need to have some sort of wind. We need to have some sort of motion to have fog. But I'm not talking about, you know, negligible, something less than five knots. I'm trying to say that if we got some strong winds, 20 knots of wind, if you have strong winds, it's very unlikely to see fog. Because if we have fog, it's because the air is so trapped. Um, it's so cold. The air is so cold. So that the surface is, is getting really cold. And then if you have strong winds, it blows the fog out. So strong winds will blow the fog out. If you have light winds or calm winds, that's when you're more likely to see fog. So that was a lot of radiation fog talk. Remember, that is not solar radiation we're talking about. We're talking about terrestrial radiation, which is the long wave energy. And that's the big conversation with the whole greenhouse um, effect, because as Mother Earth gives off all this terrestrial radiation, it's getting um, trapped in the atmosphere. All right, so we're moving on to advection fog. Hooray, advection fog. So what's going on with advection fog? Um, it says low, moist, warm air moves over a colder surface. Um, advection fog is more likely to be seen in coastal areas. So uh, I think that if you study the weather of San Francisco, you know, just about, you know, every day, you know, there's fog in San Francisco. Um, it's a coastal area right there on the water. Uh, I went there on a vacation once thinking I was going to go see a beautiful sunset and you can't see nothing. It's just foggy. So the whole idea advection fog. So I always try to create these uh, ways to remember the FAA questions to help me out to, to select the correct ABC answer. And so um, <clears throat> if you guys can see my mouse, there's A for advection. And I always remember if I draw a big uppercase A that I have to like cross my A. So I have to cross my A. If I draw an uppercase A, I have to cross it, like cross it. And so when I draw that cross in there, it makes me think about, it's about air moving across the shoreline. So advection fog is more likely to happen in coastal areas um, if there was air movement, say warmer air that moves over a cooler surface. So that'd be like the, the sea breeze, which I think we covered that last time. So advection fog. 
coastal areas, air mass moves across the coastal area. You could have advection ha fog happen in with a lake or with a river, um, but it's going to be such a more smaller event that, you know, normally when everyone talks about advection fog, they're more excited about like coastal areas. All right, we'll keep moving. Up slope fog. Woohoo! It says stable, moist air is forced up slope and cools adiabatically. Stable, moist air is forced up slope and cools adiabatically. Um, Upslope fog, I mean, this is a mountainous area phenomenon. Uh, last time, I think we covered the valley breeze and the mountain breeze. This would be more of a valley breeze conversation. So the valley breeze where the air is coming up from the valley uh, in its geography, its terrain. That geography, that terrain is a lifting force. Um, and as that air gets lifted coming up the mountain, it's going to get cooled extra rapidly. When air mass gets cooled to the dew point, we get visible moisture. Call it fog, call it cloud, visible moisture. In this case, we call it fog because the terrain is the mountain and it's developing right there, you know, near the, the terrain as the air mass gets lifted. Upslope fog. So what you're literally learning, you notice the word stable. It says stable. So fog is actually a stable phenomenon. So like unstable phenomenons would be like thunderstorms, tornadoes, um, you know, hail, crazy, you know, hazardous weather would be unstable. Fog is actually a stable weather. It, it creates a lot of hazards for us as pilots, um, especially an instrument pilot, because if you're an instrument pilot, you got to be able to see the runway to try to land or take off. So fog creates a lot of hazards for us as pilots, but it's not necessarily extra turbulent. It's, fog would not be a turbulence phenomenon. Um, fog is a stable phenomenon. So that's when we were saying if there are strong winds, which could be an unstable characteristic, if you have strong winds, you, you usually don't see fog because that would blow the fog away. Usually the fog lingers because the atmosphere is so stable and you have to wait, wait, wait for fog to burn off. Upslope fog, stable, moist air forced upslope, cools adiabatically. Okay, one more fog, one more fog on our slide. We have steam fog. Cool, dry air moves over warm water. So uh, some of the questions you have on the written exam and also for our test, uh, would involve steam fog. And one of the biggest things that you got to remember about steam fog is that it, it's one of the more hazardous for the sake of structural icing. So ice in a beverage, good. Ice on an airplane, bad. So steam fog is actually the most likely fog to uh, build up ice quick. So you talk about freezing fog, people talk about freezing fog, that's, you know, typically more of a steam fog type of element. Um, why? Because the warmer, the warmer water from below is just adding moisture. So if you have extra moisture in that fog, then there's extra moisture for you to build ice on your collecting surface. Icing is a huge conversation. Um, there's a few different types of icing. Uh, kind of think about structural icing right now. Now, steam fog, that's usually uh, an occurrence you'd see at night, correct? Uh, sure, I'm not against that answer. Like, I would tell you this, that we normally don't see fog. We normally don't see fog in the middle of the day. Um, you say the words fog at night, I'm not against that answer. Um, I would tell you the words that, uh, one of the questions on the written exam will be, when is fog most likely to occur? And okay. I think that the answer is uh, one hour before sunrise. All right, that makes so, sense. Yeah, so your answer of at night is good. I like that answer. Good thinking, Captain, because at night, that's when it's gonna get colder and we gotta cool the air mass to be able to create fog or be able to create those low clouds. 
um, throughout the day when the sun is shining, even if it's a cloudy day, I mean, throughout the day, there's solar radiation that's hitting planet Earth and getting absorbed. So it's after the sun goes to bed and it's nighttime, that's when we start seeing the temperatures drop. And the temperature just keeps dropping, 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 dropping all the way until sunrise when the temperature will start rising again. So the most likely time to actually see fog um, is right before sunrise. Okay, makes sense. Yep, so you are correct. You know, it's a nighttime phenomenon, not so much of a daytime phenomenon. But I mean, you could have fog that develops, you know, early in the night. You can have that, but that just means that the next morning it's going to be way worse because it's already so saturated, already so much moisture. Right. Hey, That's I love right. the interaction. I love the participation. Right. Keep them coming. Well, thank you. A lot of fog questions. Well, let's see if we can get through a few more slides. Um, we'll take a break shortly here. We've been going on fog. All right, so our, um, our next slide is talking about low clouds. So basically there's different families of clouds. There's different classifications of clouds. That's the word you'll see on the written exam, different classifications of clouds. And uh, it'll say that clouds are classified by, you know, blank. How do you classify clouds? Um, and I think there's three classifications. I think we're going to say like low clouds, middle clouds, high clouds, and then clouds with vertical development. Low, middle, high, vertical development. Those are going to be the clouds, um, according to the written exam, the different classifications of clouds. But really, we have different families of clouds. Um, man, that wind is pumping. I can hear it out my window. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, so why do we have wind? Differences in pressure. All that high pressure wants to get to that low pressure, wind. Um, we're talking about clouds, and the idea of clouds is uh, you could have something called a stratus cloud. That's going to be a more stable cloud. You're going to have a um, cumulus cloud, C-U-M-U-L-U-S, cumulus cloud. So in this case, we're looking at low clouds, and you could have low clouds be stratus or cumulus. In this case, uh, they're saying, the slide saying that clouds roughly going to be somewhere between the surface of 6,500 feet. They're saying that you could have a stratus cloud, and they say it's more uh, a layered cloud. It forms in stable air. It's sheet-like. So stratus, very, very important. You need to know stratus cloud you need to know that a stratus cloud is more stable. A stratus cloud is more stable. So because it's more stable of a cloud, you could expect stratus cloud to be more of a warm front phenomenon. Um, if we're talking about precipitation from a stratus cloud, you would anticipate that you'd have more of a steady precipitation. So characteristics clouds, a stratus cloud means more stable cloud. It is going to be a longer layer, a long layer. It'll be more stable, um, which would be more steady precipitation, stratus, sheet-like, big long sheet. The whole sky is covered, stratus cloud. Okay. Um, it says the next would be called a NIMBO stratus cloud. So NIMBO, N-I-M-B-O, that is a uh, Greek vocabulary word for rain, precipitation. So whenever we start adding the word NIMBO into our cloud talk, that means we're speaking about a rain cloud. So a NIMBO cloud is a rain cloud. So in this case, we have something called a NIMBO stratus. So it's a nimbo stratus, it's a stratus cloud, it's stable, but yes, it's capable of rain, it is producing rain, so then they add the word nimbo, nimbo stratus. Highly developed stratus layer. Again, you anticipate that would be steady precipitation. Um, the next says stratocumulus. Stratocumulus. So what I'm really trying to get at you um, is that there's kind of these two different families of clouds I want to focus on. We have stratus, which is more stable. We have cumulus, which is less stable. But, you know, the cloud doesn't 
it's a spectrum. There's a far spectrum and you could be way on the left side of the spectrum, way on the right side of the side of the spectrum. And you could actually have a cloud that shows both characteristics. It has some characteristics of a cumulus, it has some characteristics of a stratus, and that's what this vocabulary word's telling you. They're calling it a stratocumulus cloud. So it has some stratus qualities to it. Maybe it has some long layers. Maybe it uh, stretches out over a very wide area of the sky. But maybe there are some broken holes and there is some lifting force and there is some possible uh, cumulus characteristics to it. So then that's why they call it a stratocumulus. I hate to say the word oxymoron, but it's kind of in the middle. Um, it's not quite truly stratus, not tri quite truly cumulus. So this is the slide for low clouds. We're saying less than 6,500. Big takeaway points, a stratus cloud, it's more stable. Nimbo, you're adding rain. You're saying stratocumulus, you're actually kind of combining both elements of the cumulus cloud with the stratus cloud. Okay, well, that'll take us to uh, middle clouds. I'm looking at my clock and I'm thinking that maybe this might be a good time to take a 10 minute break. Um, is there any questions before we break? Any thoughts, comments? All right, so uh, we'll, nope, oh, somebody? All right, well, we'll be back in 10 minutes and uh, we'll uh, keep learning about clouds. Doing good, thank you, sir.
Are you guys uh, hearing me and seeing me all right? Yep. I, yep, yep. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Isaac Nesbitt's trying to get in. Isaac, you made it in. I did. Well, do you oh. got any good? You got any good weather jokes for us? Oh, you know, last time we were we were thinking about weather jokes. Just on the tip of my tongue, I had one. But next time you ask, I'll have one. I promise. Man, he's showing up late and doesn't even have a good story for us. Oh. Well, we're talking about clouds. And, uh, oh, I got to click the button so you can see it. So I think you guys see a slide that says middle clouds. Yes, sir. Awesome. Cool. Um, you're learning new vocabulary words, and now we're seeing a new vocabulary word called alto, A-L-T-O. So alto means in the middle. Um, you know, if you're a saxophone person you know you think about the alto sax it's kind of not the biggest not the smallest uh in this case we're talking about clouds in the heights we're talking about the altitudes the altitudes of clouds and we have middle clouds so we'll call those alto um could be alto stratus could be alto cumulus um could be a cumuliform cloud could be a stratoform cloud um again cumulus is less stable uh, cumulus is more poofy, like the marshmallow. Uh, think about the cream puffs. Cumulus is poofy and less stable. That would be uh, a cumulus cloud would be more of the idea of um, turbulence, uh, showery precipitation. So when you talk about precipitation, you can say it's showery, which would be less stable, or you could have steady precipitation, which would be more stable. So the more stable steady would be the stratus cloud. The less stable showery would be more of a cumulus cloud. And if they're in the middle altitudes, uh, we're saying 6,500 to 20,000, then we can use the word alto to describe those clouds for middle, middle altitude clouds. All right, we make our way to the next category, uh, the next classification of clouds. There were four classifications, uh, low, middle, high, and then clouds with vertical development. We are now on high clouds. That says clouds above 20,000 feet. And the big conversation here is the cirrus cloud, C-I-R-R-U-S, thin and wispy, often in narrow bands across the sky, Sometimes they could be blown ahead of a thunderstorm. Sometimes they could be blown ahead of a warm front. So uh, the whole idea of a cirrus cloud is it is very, very high in the sky, and it is actually made up entirely of ice crystals. So a cirrus cloud, there's really not much moisture in it at all. Because remember, cold air cannot hold as much moisture as warm air. So when you get to those high, high altitudes like that, um, there's not much moisture in the air to begin with. So the air gets cooled to the dew point and it condensates out a cloud because it's so cold, it condensates out into ice crystals and uh, there's not much moisture. So a cirrus cloud has the least amount of moisture of them all. A cirrus cloud is predominantly made up of ice crystals. Cirrus cloud is very high altitude cloud. Uh, you're seeing in this slide that they're creating some vocabulary words for us. They're saying cirrostratus, cirrocumulus. Again, same ideas. You could have a stratus cloud that's more stable, a cumulus cloud that's less stable. And if it's super high in the atmosphere, above 20,000 feet, if it's predominantly made of ice crystals, then we can use the word cirrus for cirrostratus or cirrocumulus. Um, but to be real honest, you're not going to see a whole lot of weather phenomena coming out of a cirrus cloud. Um, it's so cold, there's not much moisture. You're really not gonna see a lot of rain, snow. You're not gonna see a lot of precipitation coming out of cirrus clouds. 
high clouds. So we covered, uh, huh? We covered a high. What is going on? Hmm. Um, so we covered low altitude cloud, middle cloud, high cloud, and clouds of vertical development. That's next. Clouds of vertical development. All right. So here's um, they're telling us that it is indicative, indicative, like it indicates. So if you have a cloud that's vertically developing, you got a cloud that's growing really, really tall, that's indicative. It indicates unstable air, ooh, unstable air. Um, these are the clouds that are gonna make thunderstorms. All right, clouds of vertical development. Um, it says we have options of cumulus, towering cumulus, cumulonimbus. They are all cumulus clouds. So cumulus, um, it says flat bases and the cloud boils upwards. Towering cumulus is a cumulus cloud that has been fed for a while. So it's grown so tall that it's like a huge tall tower. Cumulonimbus, towering cumulus fed too much. It's eager to spit it back out. They're talking about the moisture, precipitation. They call that a thunderstorm. Um, you'll have a test question. There's an FAA test question about this topic, and it asks uh, what cloud has the most turbulence? What cloud has the most turbulence? Personally, I think all these clouds are turbulent clouds, but the test question says cumulonimbus. There's a lot of folks that could argue towering cumulus is just as good of an answer, but the FAA written example, the FAA written exam, the correct answer is cumulonimbus. The cumulonimbus cloud is going to have the most thunder, is going to have the most uh, turbulence. So the idea is that uh, we're going to talk about the different stages of a thunderstorm, the updrafts and the downdrafts. And the idea is that uh, the towering cumulus, we're probably seeing a lot of updrafts, which is bad, you know, because it's growing and there's drafts, vertical vertical drafts in the atmosphere but by the time you get to cumulonimbus we're seeing both up and down drafts so you're having wind shear very strong winds with inside that cloud so um there's this conversation about the cowboys and the indians so you know like when you go back in history and you analyze the cowboys and the indians and you try to figure out like gosh um you know why were the cowboys so good the cowboys were so good because they had technology you know, they had guns and uh, technology, but the Indians were so good because they knew how to read mother nature. And so us as pilots, you know, we kind of think about both of those aspects. You know, we could be like the cowboys and the fact that we have really awesome technology. We have inside of our cockpit, oh, Dylan's trying to get in. All right, I hit a button and Dylan is back in. We're happy to have you, Dylan. We're talking about the Cowboys and the Indians. And uh, the whole idea is that the Cowboys were so good because they had technology. The Indians were so good because they were able to read Mother Nature. And so us as pilots, there are some cowboy moments for us because we have this fancy glass screen in our cockpit. It shows us onboard radar information. It shows us weather information. We could try to navigate around bad weather using our technology. But we also need to kind of go back to that Indian side and know how to read Mother Nature. And so the best tool that you have as a pilot when you're trying to fly around weather is simply looking out the window. So think about it this way, guys. If you, uh, when you're flying your airplane and you see a cloud that's growing super tall, the taller the cloud grows, the more turbulence is inside that cloud. What makes the cloud grow so dang high? The, the cloud grows so tall because there is vertical development. There is uh, wind that is rushing upwards. There's updrafts, thermals, uh, convective activity. So there's wind shear. The reason the cloud grows so tall is because it's so unstable. Um, remember when bad weather comes through and you're like, oh my gosh, that cloud's so dark. What makes the cloud so dark to begin with? Maybe some participation. What makes a cloud so dark? If it's oversaturated with water. That's a common answer, but not really what I'm looking for. But but good, but I like it. Any other ideas? 
there's truth to that. There's truth to that. I'm not trying to say it's wrong. Um, Could it be that it's so thick that light can't really pass through? Right. That's what I'm getting at. It's so tall. It's so tall. So like clouds with vertical development, the cloud grows tall, 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 and it grows so tall that it's casting its own shadow on itself. So I agree that there is more moisture in it because it's so tall, but it's so dark because it's so tall. We're only seeing the base of the cloud when we're on planet Earth. But when we're flying in the atmosphere, we have a new perspective where we can visually see how tall does this cloud grow? And you're out flying on a solo cross country and some clouds are starting to pop up in the, towards the end of summer. And you see a cloud that grows so tall that your airplane couldn't even out climb that cloud because it grows so tall. It's above your airplane service ceiling. Well, that is a cloud you do not want to tangle with. You don't want to go getting too close to that cloud because there are some serious drafts, some very serious turbulence because it makes the cloud grow that tall to begin with. And from your perspective as the pilot, it wouldn't look that dark because you're looking at it from the side of the cloud or maybe above the cloud. So um, clouds with vertical development, that's what this whole conversation is about. Clouds that have vertical development are cumulus clouds. They are cumuliform clouds. And according to the FAA written test bank, the cumulonimbus cloud is going to be the most turbulence. Um, but they're all bad, and you, as a real-world pilot flying around, you can assess by looking out the window what clouds are going to be better or worse to stay away from, because if it grows extra tall, extra high, then that means there's going to be extra updrafts, extra convective activity inside of that cloud. Um, there's a common question that you get from... Um, from pilots, they say, what's the most dangerous type of thunderstorm? What's the most dangerous type of thunderstorm? They give you three options. They say uh, you could have a, um, a supercell, you could have a squall line, you could have embedded, embedded thunderstorm. And we've talked about some of these. A uh, supercell, it's so strong that it bursts through the tropopause. So it's just, it grows so tall. It's so strong. Supercell bursts through the triple pause. We're talking about like tornadoes, hurricanes, supercell. Another type of dangerous thunderstorm we said was squall line. We actually saw a squall line in one of our charts that we were studying the other day. Uh, squall line is so dangerous because it's a non-frontal active band of thunderstorms. Stre it could stretch several hundred miles long and you may not be able to get through that band. And then the other type of thunderstorm that everybody gets so excited about, they say is so dangerous, so hazardous, is called embedded, embedded thunderstorm. So for us here as private pilot applicants who uh, must maintain, you know, three miles visibility, 500 below, 2,000 across, 1,000 feet above all the clouds, um, it's not the same conversation as an instrument pilot. So the instrument pilot is going to go flying in the clouds. An embedded thunderstorm is so dangerous because the pilot thinks that they're flying around in good, good old fashioned smooth stratus clouds. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere is getting, you know, their teeth rattled because they actually found themselves in embedded thunderstorms. Like the thunderstorms are embedded inside of all these other clouds. With technology, we can see that with radar, but you know, the old fashioned um, pilots that are, they're flying around without radar, um, without eight, uh, the ADSB in and out technology, uh, they may not, they may not be able to pick up on that until they start experiencing the turbulence. So we're having a lot of cloud conversation. And the whole idea is uh, clouds with vertical development. Clouds with vertical development. And that means unstable air. Stability of the air is defined by the lapse rate. So there is more than two degrees Celsius drop with every thousand feet of altitude gain if you got unstable air. Cumulus clouds make up thunderstorms clouds. Towering cumulus, cumulonimbus. All right, so let me click the button. Oh. Okay, so here's a nice chart where we can physically see some of these different clouds and their families and their classifications. So here's a cumulus cloud underneath my mouse. 
cumulus cloud, CU, and it's more of a poofy. It's more like a, a sheep, um, cotton balls, poofs, cumulus cloud. It, it is not long. It is not wide. There are lots of vertical vertical developments that can happen with this cloud that prevents a long layer. Cumulus cloud, less stable. Bottom right, we have a stratocumulus. Stratocumulus. So here in this stratocumulus, we have a combination of stratus and a combination of cumulus. So you can see, uh, like my mouse is, that there is still some poofies. There's still poofiness to these clouds but they are starting to form in longer layers, wide, long layers. That is a stratus quality. That's why it's stratoform. So stratus quality having long layers. This chart calls it stratocumulus because they're saying it has some cumulus properties to it as well. There are some stratus clouds um, over on the left here in the center of the screen. It says stratus. And it's showing some really lower clouds that are long layers and nimbostratus, which would be a rain cloud. But I mean, look at how wide this nimbostratus cloud is. So nimbo means rain, stratus, it's a long layer. Okay, we got an alto cumulus over here on the right. Alto means middle altitude and cumulus, cumuliform, because it's see all the poofiness to it. The poofiness to it makes it less stable, gives it some cumuliform qualities. Um, alto stratus, here's a nice looking alto stratus, and look how long that layer is. Stratus, nice, long, stable layers. We got a cirrocumulus. Again, it's just about all ice crystals up there, but it's still got those poofy elements to it. We got a cirrostratus. Again, it's a cirrus cloud, super high altitude. And what you notice about the cirrostratus, it can create really cirrus clouds in general. Cirrus clouds in general can create what they call a halo around the, uh, the sun, a ring around the sun. So you can kind of see where my mouse, I'm drawing that ring around the sun. And that is a sign that you might possibly have a warm front approaching. So having a ring around the sun shows that you might have some some weather moving in. Here's cirrus cloud underneath my mouse now. Think about those long, wispy ice crystals. And then the big boy himself, the cumulonimbus cloud. So here's our cumulonimbus cloud. It's definitely cumuliform. There's lots of poofiness to it. It's unstable. It vertical develops. Look at this sucker vertically developing so high, way up there. And then what you can see with the, some of these uh, towering cumulus, some of these cumulonimbus clouds, you can see that they form what's called an anvil. So up here at the higher altitudes, the cloud stops growing vertically. Why? Because it's reached the tropopause. It's reached that inversion layer, the temperature inversion layer, the cap in the atmosphere, uh, the jet stream. It, it's reached these other phenomenon that prevent vertical motion. So then the top of that cloud cannot continue growing up. So then it gets blown sideways by the wind. That towering cumulus uh, that we'll call it the anvil, the anvil top of that cloud is showing you where the cloud is headed. So like in this example, if left is west and right is east, this cloud is blowing from the west to the east. And the top of the anvil is where you're seeing the direction pointing where the cloud's going to go. You as a pilot, you would want to really avoid flying underneath the anvil. So right here in this area where my mouse is underneath the anvil, that is where you want to avoid putting your airplane because that's where the, the weather is moving and that's where you're going to have those convective patterns, um, vertical motion patterns start to develop. That's where hail would be thrown from. So this is kind of a good picture. Uh, if there's any thoughts or questions about this picture, we could we could entertain them. All right, we'll keep moving. So clouds, we had a lot of cloud talk. That was fun. That was exciting. Oh, I'm supposed to tell you my cloud joke. Why does the no? What does the rain cloud? Gosh. Hmm. 
what what why does the what does the rain cloud wear underneath its rain cloak? That's it. What does the rain cloud wear under its raincoat? It's thunderwear. <laughs> I know, it's great. It's great stuff. Good stuff. Oh geez. Love it. I love these dad joke uh, weather jokes. More of that. More of that. Oh, exciting stuff, weather. So we're moving into precipitation. Um, precipitation, any form of particle, liquid or solid that falls from the atmosphere. Precipitation. Uh, could have several detrimental effects on aircraft. Occurs when water or ice particles grow too large to be supported by the atmosphere. Vertically developed systems can sustain water, ice particles for much longer. Okay, super cooled water droplets. That's a huge vocabulary word. It can remain in the liquid state as low as negative 40 Celsius. Goodness. So we get it. Precipitation. We talked about the different three states of matter. Um, and the gas water vapor is suspended in the air. But when we reach the dew point and we're 100% saturated, we're more than 100% relative humidity. Once we reach 100% relative humidity, well, we can't remain as a gas. The water can't remain as a gas, so then it has to become condensation. And as we get so much condensation built up in the cloud, there's only so much condensation nuclei. It becomes only so much space that the, we can hold, that the cloud can hold up those water droplets until eventually they'll fall from the sky. Um, Depending upon the temperature, we could see that in the form of snow, hail, rain. And the vertically developed systems, those are the big words, vertically developed systems can sustain water and ice particles for much longer. Why? How about some participation? Why do the vertically developed systems sustain water and ice particles longer? Does it have to possibly do with the updrafts and downdrafts? Up, up, up. All the updrafts? 100% gotcha. correct answer. So with a vertically developed cloud, it's grown so tall vertically because of the updrafts. And so if you have extra rain, extra snow, extra hail, all these different precipitations from that cloud, the updrafts keep that precipitation up in the cloud even longer. So a vertically developed cloud will sustain water, ice much longer. And then the big vocabulary word, super cooled water droplets. Uh, if you're taking notes, you call that SLD. You'll see this again, SLD, super cooled liquid droplet, SLD, super cooled liquid droplet. Um, think of it like, like chubby rain, like super fat, super cold water droplet and it can remain in the liquid state even below freezing. So we're talking about thunderstorm clouds, we're talking about freezing rain. We are talking about freezing rain. Freezing rain is a very serious issue for us as pilots. Um, you know, I've picked up ice a few times, I hate to admit it, but if you fly airplanes long enough, you're gonna fly around, you'll find yourself picking up ice, it's a bad deal, we really need to avoid it, we do not wanna have structural icing. Heaven forbid, if it ever happens to you, I hope you get out of that situation really, really quickly. You know, maybe a 180 degree turn, turn around. If you just came from an area where you weren't picking up ice, maybe you should head back that way. Maybe you could climb, maybe you could descend. There's a lot of different options to do with structural icing. Um, of all the times that I've picked up ice though, I've only picked up clear ice, I've only picked up, you know, super cool water droplets, freezing rain, maybe only once or twice. But it's just crazy how quick the stuff really does develop. One minute you're flying along and the next minute you're just covered in ice. I mean, it's very rapid. So super cool water droplets, they're actually water falling from the sky, but they're so cold, like cohesion. And then when that water droplet hits your wing and spreads out, it freezes and covers up a, a very large area. And next thing you know, you're picking up a lot of ice really quick, clear ice. So super cooled water droplets, SLD, super cooled liquid droplet. Okay, drizzle and rain. Drizzle, tiny water droplets associated with fog or low stratus. 
rain, droplets larger than 0 0.02 inches. It's said to be showery if it starts, stops, changes intensity suddenly. And then virga, new vocabulary word. Virga, rain that evaporates before reaching the surface. It can cause its own fog. Um, I'm supposed to ask, uh, let's see, drizzle. So my old flight instructor asked me, it's like, oh, well, why does, why does Snoop Dogg, why does Snoop Dogg need an umbrella? And then my, I was like, why does Snoop Dogg need an umbrella? And he said, oh, for drizzle, my nizzle. And I was like, oh, okay. And my flight instructor told me that. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's, a, that's the reason. All right, somebody else getting in the room. So drizzle, um, drizzle is small, tiny water droplets. So somebody just got in. Um, yeah, that was me and my computer crashed. Perfect. Gosh, why are you crashing it? <laughs> Better than an airplane. Yeah, now we're talking, yeah. So uh, precipitation can have its own hazards for sure. And uh, in this case, we're studying some different types of precipitation. Drizzle, uh, tiny water droplets. Rain, you know, we could have showery or steady. If it's showery rain, it's probably more of a cumulus cloud. If it's steady rain, it's probably more of a stratus cloud. Virga is the new vocabulary for this slide. So you think about um, rain that's falling from the, from the cloud, but it's not actually reaching the ground. This rain is evaporating before it can reach the ground. So the, the rain droplets are falling from the cloud, so it's a liquid state. As the, the liquid water falls, it cools. As the air... Um, Hmm, I think I said it wrong. As it falls, okay, yeah, I said it wrong. So as the liquid water falls, it's decreasing altitude. So it's getting to a closer to planet Earth where the temperature gets warmer. And so this, this water droplet never reaches the ground and it actually evaporates before it reaches the ground because it fell into some warmer air. Well, we said energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It can only be transferred, latent heat energy from the earlier slides. As that liquid water droplet changes states of matter and now becomes water vapor, some of that energy from the warmer air is going to uh, be absorbed into that water droplet to become a gas, which will leave the surrounding air extra cool. So when you have Virga, you can have some invisible hazards, such as a cold column downdraft. So in an area of Virga, it is possible to have a cold column downdraft. So you, so you should, as a pilot should try to avoid flying near Virga anyways. But if you do start flying near Virga, some pilots have made the mistake of trying to fly underneath the Virga. They see the, the water falling from the sky, they see it evaporate, and so they decide to fly underneath that area. And there can be a very cold column downdraft in that area with the latent heat energy transfer that's going on. So Virga can create some turbulent situations. Okay, ice pellets and hail. Ice pellets occur when the rain is falling from a temperature inversion, passes through an underlying colder air. It's a strong indicator of freezing rain above. That'll be one of the questions on your written exam. Ice pellets, um, call that sleet ice pellets. Rain is falling from a temperature inversion and it passes through an underlying colder air. So typically, as we go higher in altitude, we expect to see the air get colder. So typically, as we get closer to planet, to the surface of the Earth, we expect to see the temperature get warmer. Well, if we have something called a temperature inversion in the atmosphere that day, um, there's an area where you had rain, it was liquid, as it fell and got closer to planet Earth, 
you would normally expect it to get warmer, warmer, warmer. But because there's an inversion layer, it actually passes through a colder air mass and freezes on its way down. That would be sleet, that would be ice pellet. So you'll have that test question. Ice pellet is a sign that there is warmer air above. Strong indicator of freezing rain above because you'd have to have warmer air up there to have it be a, a liquid because it's now a solid ice down at the surface. Oh, well, hail. It says hail. Hail occurs when freezing water droplets suspended in strong upward currents grow in size as they collide with other water droplets. So we talk about those convective circulation patterns. Say so you got a, a cumulonimbus cloud, a towering cumulus cloud, you got a thunderstorm cloud. There's these updrafts and there's downdrafts and there's a circular habit going on where um, you got these freezing water droplets that start falling. Then they get caught in an updraft and they get thrown back up again to refreeze and they fall back down to melt and they get thrown back up and they just keep going through this cycle and keep getting larger and larger and larger until finally that hailstone is so large that the updraft can't stop it um, and it falls to the earth. Some serious thunderstorms, they can throw hail uh, over 20 miles. Two zero, 20 miles. Hail. Uh, very hazardous for aircraft. We do not want to get hit with hailstones when we're moving 100 miles an hour through the air. Snow, precipitation composed entirely of ice crystals. Snow and snow showers are distinguished the same as rain. So you can say the word showery, you can say the word uh, steady. Um, so snow, it really has everything to do with temperature range. So, uh, rain is way more predictable than snow because we can see rain, we can see that uh, visible moisture, we can see that rain happen throughout a very large temperature range. But unfortunately, snow is such a, uh, a narrow range phenomenon that just literally a few degrees worth of change can really, you know, have it snow or not snow. So uh, snow is also really tricky because it can screw with our radar picture. So uh, because the snow particles are already frozen, uh, your radar dish may not possibly see extra snow behind the, the front. So wherever the beginning of the snow shower is, you might see that picture of where the snow shower is on the radar, but then as you go extra deep behind the leading edge of the snow showers, the radar might look clear, but there might actually be extra snow behind there. So there's a lot of issues with snow, um, and it's very similar to the idea of rain, but it's a more narrow rain band, more narrow temperature band, more narrow temperature range for snow. Oh goodness, we're moving our way into air masses. Woohoo, air masses. So, um, air masses, large bodies of air with fairly uniform temperature and moisture content. Okay, we said there's really only three elements to an air mass, temperature, pressure, moisture. Temperature, pressure, moisture. This slide says air masses, large bodies of air with fairly uniform temperature and moisture content, okay. They form where the air remains stationary for at least several days. So you have this large air mass and it hangs out in this certain area for a few days. That air mass is going to start to take on some of the characteristics of the land mass that it's hanging out on top of. Land mass, water mass, surface of planet Earth. It says gradually takes on the temperature and moisture properties of the underlying surface. Yep, that's what we said says the area where an air mass acquires its temperature and moisture and determine its stability is the source region. So this is one of uh, the famous uh, questions that Sean always uh, gets people on for stage checks. So if you take a stage check with our um, with Sean McDermott, 
uh, he will not, you know, let you through the weather section unless you understand this piece of information. So um, the source region. So we could have an air mass that lives over the ocean. That air mass would be called maritime. It would be called a maritime air mass that lives over the ocean. If you have an air mass that lives over the land, you would call that a continental air mass. So if you have a maritime air mass, it probably has more moisture. If you have a continental air mass, it probably has less moisture. Okay, so this air mass could also then come from the north or it could come from the south. So if you had an air mass that came from the north, you would call that a uh, polar. It is a polar air mass. If you have an air mass that comes from the south, you would call that tropical, a tropical air mass. So here in our slide, uh, we have a few different possible air masses that we could study. Um, the first one is on the bottom left, and it's where my mouse is circling. That would be called a maritime tropical air mass. This maritime tropical air mass. It came from the water. Maritime, it's got more moisture. Tropical, it came from the south, so it's extra warm. Temperature, pressure, and moisture. This air mass has more moisture, and it's warmer. And as it moves inland, it would have certain characteristics and qualities. Different than a maritime polar air mass. So now my, my mouse is circling a different air mass. Yes, it's maritime. Yes, there's moisture, but it's coming from the north. So we call that polar, maritime polar air mass. As that maritime polar air mass moves closer to us, it would have different qualities of temperature, pressure, and moisture. Different than a continental polar, continental polar. This air mass, continental, came over the land. There is less moisture. It came from the north, so it's polar, colder temperature. Less moisture, colder temperature, continental polar air mass. Different than this air mass from Mexico. You would call that continental tropical. It's continental, it came over the land, there's less moisture, but it's tropical, it came from the south, it's gonna be warmer. And again, as you continue following this, you see find more maritime tropical air masses, more uh, polar, uh, trop, uh, dang it, polar maritime, maritime polar air masses. And so we're really starting to analyze all these different air masses. And as these air masses intermingle with each other, that's where we're going to start to see more of this weather occur and happen. The boundary layer between the air masses is called front. F-R-O-N-T, a front. A front is a boundary layer between two air masses. These are the different air masses we've discussed. Um, air masses have different characteristics of temperature, pressure, and moisture. Um, we've discussed a lot of them already. Temperature, we know that the warmer air mass can hold more moisture. Uh, pressure. We know a low pressure system is more of a counterclockwise lifting. We know a high pressure system is more of a clockwise pushing down, more stable. So these air masses intermingle in the great, in the great um, quest for achieving equilibrium. We're going to see some weather. Oh. Is that a question? Hmm. Well, I don't see anybody questioning, so I think we're doing all right. It's getting windy out there. I can hear it out my window. So we're getting really close. We got a few more minutes. Let's see if we can cover a few more slides, more weather. Okay. Warming from below. Um, lower layers of the air mass gets heated and vertical movement of the air develops can result in extreme instability, warming from below. So in this case, they're uh, describing to you the lake effect. Uh, we see this a lot in northern Indiana. So you have this, you know, lake waters. Um, the idea is that the lake is a water mass. The water mass takes longer to heat up. The water mass will maintain its temperature longer. The water mass has circular patterns inside the water and it, uh, 
the water mass will not release its heat very quickly. The water mass will hold its heat longer. So on a cold day, there's some strong winds that's blowing cold, dry air over top of that warmer water mass. That warmer water mass slowly is releasing the heat and that is called warming from below. Uh, vertical development is a product of heat. So as we get warming from below and we get the air starting to rise more rapidly, then we can start to see clouds with more vertical development. So this is kind of the conversation of like lake effect snow, lake effect showers, lake effect weather. Um, not only could it be lake effect, but you could see the same trends develop, you know, um, near bodies of water, such as the ocean or even large rivers and lakes. Yep. Warming from below. So anytime we talk about the word warming, so I'm, I'm trying to prepare you to pass this exam. I'm trying to prepare you to think through these, these questions. And so anytime there's heating from below, we are creating instability. Anytime there's heating from below, we are creating rising air. As air rises extra fast, that means the air will get cooled extra fast and it is less stable. Warming from below. Okay, the next slide talks about cooling from below. So what we're doing is we're describing air masses. We talked about all these different air masses and as these air masses travel, they will be augmented and these air masses will change depending upon what happens on the surface of the earth beneath the air mass as the air mass travels. So the air mass could get cooled from below. Lower, um, lower layers are cooled lower layers of the air mass would be cooled, vertical movement would be inhibited, and stability would be improved. Cooling from below can cause temperature inversions, which is a stable phenomenon, resulting in lower ceilings, poor visibility for long periods of time. Cooling from below. Remember we talked about fog, low clouds, lingering weather, uh, stationary front. Okay, we're on a big, big topic here, fronts, F-R-O-N-T, front, fronts. Front is a boundary layer between two air masses. It's named according to the temperature of the advancing air relative to the temperature of the air it is replacing. So a front is a boundary layer between two air masses. You must learn that definition, like the back of your hand. If you want to get through any stage check or check ride and understand weather, you got to know what a front is. It's a boundary layer between two air masses. The front gets its name um, describing the air mass behind the frontal zone. So a cold front is bringing in colder air. A cold front would have warmer air ahead of the front because the colder air is displacing the warmer air. Fronts, boundary layer between two air masses. Frontal discontinuities, the comparatively rapid changes in the characteristics of an air mass. So they're saying um, in the area of the front, you're gonna see some changes, some discontinuities, some changes. So when you pass through the frontal zone, if you fly your airplane over the frontal zone, you're gonna see some changes as you go from one air mass into the next air mass. You're gonna see some changes. What kind of changes would you see? I'm glad you asked. It says temperature. Temperature, easily recognizable discontinuities across the front. Very noticeable at the surface, less so aloft. Could be wind, yeah. Wind, the most reliable indication of crossing a front, period. There is always, capital always, a wind change during a frontal passage. That is one of the questions on your test. Pressure, pressure changes abruptly um, at frontal passage. Make sure to update your altimeter setting. And that's why we always talk about that, you know, flying from area high to low, low to high, uh, different pressure. So pressure, temperature, and moisture. Um, you're gonna have different characteristics for different air masses. When you cross the front, you will see a change in, in those uh, qualities. 
All right. Frontal weather. So why do we care about fronts? We care about fronts because they're a lifting force. As one air mass tries to overtake the other air mass, there becomes an area of change, an area of lift, where one air mass is going to try to get lifted on top of the other air mass. Area of lifting force. Unstable. Instability. The area of lifting is not going to be as stable as when you're inside the central of the air mass. Frontal weather. Weather produced depends on available moisture, stability of the air being lifted, speed of the frontal movement, and other elements. So there's so many variables going on that even the weatherman can't predict it correctly. But these are the basics of weather theory. Frontal weather can sometimes be dramatic and violent. Other times, much less so. So just because a front is transitioning through our area doesn't mean we're going to have extreme weather. But if there is extreme weather going on outside, it means there probably is a front moving through. So I've heard uh, examiners ask students, oh, would you ever fly through a cold front? Would you ever fly through a warm front? Would you ever fly through a front? And yeah, we can fly through fronts all the time but they should be respected because not every front is equal. Some fronts are gonna be way more violent, way more lifting force than other fronts. Knowing what to expect is critical as an aviator. So front is lifting force. So the first front we're gonna dive into, cold front, C-O-L-D, cold front like a snow plow. So here's a nice picture of the cold front. It is cold, heavy air that's staying close to the surface and it's displacing warmer, lighter, less dense air and it's displacing it vertically. This rapid, this rapid, 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 this rapid upward displacement can easily create thunderstorms. The speed the front is moving has a dramatic effect on the weather produced. So uh, the other day um, we talked about cold fronts. Cold front would typically uh, a low pressure system spins counterclockwise. Um, the cold front would typically form on the western side of the low pressure center and then counterclockwise wrap around that low pressure center. And here's a picture of it. Um, underneath my mouse you can see that there's a blue uh, front with half icicles, blue icicles. And so the colder air mass is behind the frontal zone. And as that colder air mass moves forward, in this picture from left to right, then the warmer air mass is now being displaced and lifted extra rapidly in the frontal zone. So as this weather develops, we see a cumulonimbus cloud. It's you know, actually got an anvil even top on it, anvil top of this cumulonimbus cloud. This weather is developing in the frontal zone. In the frontal zone, we have weather developing, frontal weather. Uh, we saw a squall line recently on one of our surface analysis charts. The squall line is so different because it develops far ahead of the cold front. They say it is non-frontal because the squall line develops 50 to 200 miles ahead of the cold front. And it would be a very fast, rapid moving cold front to develop a squall line. Cold front, very unstable, lots of lifting force. The next slide is describing, bum, 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 warm front. Warm front, it's like a wheelchair ramp up a very long ramp, like a wheelchair going up a very long ramp, warm front. The warm air is trying to overtake and replace cooler air. It's usually much slower than a cold front. The weather produced by warm front is typically well ahead of the front itself. And that's why I was describing to you, you can get that halo, that circle around the sun, and you might see the cirrus clouds days before the warm front ever gets to you. The warm front does not move very rapidly. The warm front is slower moving. So the weather will linger much longer. 
It'll rain for days and it'll be steady rain for days. That's more of a warm front phenomenon versus the cold front phenomenon where it rains like cats and dogs and thunderstorming for a few hours for, for, and then in a few hours later, it's perfectly clear and fine. Cold front versus warm front. We're really wrapping our brain around these different topics. Um, so in your picture, you can see the warm front. Uh, they describe it, uh, they characterize it, they depict it as a red line. The frontal is a red front and has half suns, half circles, warm front. Um, this is a warmer air mass that is behind the frontal zone. It is a warmer air mass. And in this picture, as that warmer air tries to move from left to right, the warmer air is fighting against colder air. So now under my mouse, there's a colder air mass. Because the cold air is so thick and dense, the cold air will hug the ground and not allow the warm air to overtake it so easily. So the warm air starts spilling forward and it's like a wheelchair ramp. So the warm front is trying to overtake this colder air mass, but it does not have as much steam, does not have as much energy, does not have the ability to lift very rapid. So the clouds that you're seeing on the warm front are much more stratus, much more stratus-like, versus the clouds that we're seeing in the cold front, which is more cumulus-like. So both are lifting force. Warm front and cold front are both lifting force, but the cold front is way more rapid, way more unstable. The warm front is more stable lifting. Okay, warm front. Ooh, stationary front. Bump, 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 stationary. Stationary fronts, opposing forces are relatively balanced. They tend to remain stationary or meander slightly, affecting flying conditions for several days. Usually produces a mix of weather that could be found in cold and warm fronts. So in this example, um, you're seeing the stationary front uh, is a frontal line with both blue and red. We have blue icicles and red half suns on the opposite side of the frontal line. Uh, we have the colder air mass behind the blue icicles. You have the warmer air mass behind the red half suns. So a front is a boundary layer between two air masses. There is a boundary layer here. There are two air masses with different temperature, pressure, and moisture qualities. There is lifting force in that boundary layer, but Inside this area where these two air masses are trying to push against each other, neither air mass is that much stronger than the other. So the actual frontal zone, the front lines of the battle, is not moving. The actual frontal zone is hanging out, meandering, little to no movement. And so whatever kind of weather occurs in this area uh, will last for a longer period of time. It's not going to move out very quickly. There's nothing moving very quickly. That's why it's called stationary, stationary front. Um, this is actually a bigger conversation is cyclogenesis, C-Y-C-L-O-G-E-N-S-I-S. -S. Cyclogenesis would be describing the life, pri the life cycle of a low pressure system. This would be one of the stages of cyclogenesis uh, where there's little to no movement, so there's not a lot of motion yet. We're starting to see weather occurring. We're starting to see lifting happen. We're starting to see clouds develop, but nothing is moving or pushing out very rapidly yet. Um, as the life cycle continues for a stationary front, we would possibly see more counterclockwise rotation, and then we'd start to see more defined cold and warm fronts. But in this case, it's not quite cold or warm front because neither air mass is moving very rapidly. stationary front. And that brings us to occluded front. Oh my goodness, occluded front. <laughs> occluded front, the one with a lot going on. That's kind of fun. So occluded front, when a fast moving cold front catches up to the slower moving warm front. 
You could have something called a cold front occlusion. You could have something called a warm front occlusion. Warm front occlusion is not very uh, common, very uncommon. The more common is the cold front occlusion. So the whole idea is that a front is a boundary layer between two air masses. Typically, we'd see the cold front, we'd see the warm front, and they both would wrap around a low pressure center, and the cold front will move faster than the warm front. As that cold front continues to move, 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 it will catch up to the warm front. When the cold front catches up to the warm front, when the cold front tries to overtake the warm front, we are now starting to see occluded front. So um, we have steps A, B, and C of the occlusion. Here is the cold front, the blue line with, with icicles. The, blue, it, the cold front is getting close to catching up to zippering shut to the warm front. So in a occluded front, we have three air masses. Count them, one, two, three. We have the coldest air mass, we have the cool air, air mass, and the warm air mass. And there's now gonna be three air masses intermin intermingling. There's gonna be two fronts intermingling. There's gonna be twice the lifting force during an occluded front. So step B, the cold front has merged with the warm front. And so now there is new symbology. This is some of your questions for your short answer homework. There is a uh, new symbology, it is purple. So now it is a purple front. We have the icicle triangles and the half suns on the same side of the frontal line. In, in this case, they're both pointing, in this case to the right, because the frontal zone is moving from left to right, and now there's twice as much lifting force, three different air masses trying to intermingle and achieve equilibrium all in the same spot. Um, and then as it just gets deeper and deeper, you can see that there's gonna be more and more severe weather, more and more cumulus clouds develop, more thunderstorms, hail, um, serious weather, very, very uh, violent, hazardous weather with occlusions, occluded front. Weather patterns. Gosh, that takes us to the end of our slideshow. Uh, we just have a few minutes left in class. I don't think it makes sense for me to launch the next slideshow. Um, that was 6B. So we're gonna be going on 6C next time. We are over halfway through chapter six. So if you're not over halfway through all your homework, through all your reading for chapter six, you might wanna um, think about catching up on that. Uh, we're looking at probably having a quiz next time over chapter six, and we'll administer that through Zoom so you can type your answers to me um, through the private chat for Zoom. Was there any general questions uh, before we say goodbye or any questions about weather or anything general? I'm good for now. Hey, I appreciate the feedback, thank you. All right, well, I guess we will sign off and say goodbye. I thank you so much for tuning in and spending the time with us today. Uh, we're gonna keep moving forward. The, the next test will actually be chapter six and seven together. <coughs> and uh, I appreciate you guys putting in the time. I hope you have a great day. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, too.